Hello, welcome back to most likely the P Squared Biology Podcast. This should be an interesting one. I don't completely know yet if I'll call it animals and intelligence or animals and morality. We'll see. I'll probably make it the one that seems more inclusive. Of course, you can't talk about animal morality without animal intelligence. Animal animal intelligence comes from the brain. Nervous system. And first and foremost, I don't want to make it seem like it's everything. Of course, it's not. Otherwise, every single animal that has evolved over the course of millions and millions of years, they would all have big brains if it was truly better. And it's not always. It's just one tool for perceiving the world, interacting with the world. And it's a very energy-hungry organ, for sure. And not every animal has a constant input of resources. So it has to allocate the resources as best as possible. And the optimal strategies get passed down over time. So you even look at animals with barely any neurons in their brain. They they still do some fairly complicated things, we think. At least we would consider complex. But as for what I'm trying to do in this podcast, trying to... Well, first and foremost, this is not going to be all-inclusive. There's going to be stuff I'm going to forget. I'm going to say, oh, why didn't I cover that? This is such a broad, interesting topic. There's so much research. Even just looking at the Wikipedia page of animal cognition, it just goes on and on and so many subcategories. Very interesting stuff. And it's still only one thing about an animal, right? But people are so interested because I guess they like to see how they relate to us. And one of our main strategies or weapons of nature is our cognition. And yeah, we just like to compare other things, see what's like us, what's not like us. You know, that's just the way it is. So there'll be debates until the end of time. Do animals have morality? Are they really smart? Do they have souls? And like to tackle some of those, (coughs) share what. We know what has been figured out, what <clears throat> the evidence seems to point to, what animals are, what they aren't, and just what conclusions can we come to or most likely come to. That's what I'd like to do here today. Rest assured, I'm not trying to make anyone a vegetarian or a vegan. I myself am not a vegetarian, vegetarian or vegan. It's just not within my spiritual bounds to do that yet or ever (laughs) Um, of course I'm not going to go around eating endangered animals that you know we need on this planet if all things considered if they factory farm meat that doesn't come from a sentient animal like yeah sure I'll eat that all things considered over the one that actually lived but the grand scheme of things I mean I know it's controversial but I don't have to defend myself there that's just a personal preference and people go around quoting Peter Singer like he's a scientist over a philosopher, but, I mean, to each their own. If they make a grand claim that people that eat animals are really not going to live as long, are not moral or psychopaths, like, show me the evidence. I mean, like, I know fish can feel pain to some degree, but, you know, it's not the same between a fish nervous system and a mammal nervous system for sure because it even there's huge variations in fish for sure they're the most diverse vertebrate group like you look at an eagle ray or a manta ray I mean it can recognize its own reflection and that was the first fish they ever found out that can do that although they're a cartilaginous fish which is definitely different from bony fish there's we're more related to bony fish than bony fish are to cartilaginous fish, which all sharks and rays are cartilaginous fish, and sharks are pretty smart too. Personally, I don't get why everything that seemingly has sentience has human-like qualities, which what is a human-like quality? What, what do we have that all animals don't have? The more research that's been done, they can do all kinds of things, and I'll get into that. Animals in general, especially the most smart birds and mammals, are crazy smart. 
like almost to the point where it's like there's little difference between me and that like there's a few orders of magnitude we can communicate better we can uh do complex things more but besides that like we share so many similar emotions uh we can greet they can grieve they can do all kinds of problem solving i mean there's don't get me wrong kids are still way more smarter than the smartest animal or so it seems so far but for sure animals are very misunderstood and people just like to stay in their own bubble that hey everything in the zoo must be stupid because they're not a human they can't talk which is definitely not true and before i begin i meant to bring that up about fish feeling pain because you go fishing you assume they don't feel pain so fishing is perfectly fine i still think you can definitely be a, a fisherman and do it ethically you know keep what you can keep release things fairly quickly use circle hooks crimp the barb which i didn't you i used to never crimp the barb i used to think it was necessary for hook and fish and it's just a real life changer a game changer i mean can release the fish so easy in comparison sometimes the barb would get stuck so even if you did again eventually get it off the barb get it off the hook with the barb you know they were so exhausted and out of breath that yeah it was not pretty sometimes and definitely don't use treble hooks because those you plan on releasing fish definitely use circle hooks you can still have fun you can you know they especially fishing after big fish they'll definitely fight use all their might because they can you know you're not when you're fighting a little fish you're going to easily overpower it and you're going to release it it's just going to swim away you know they're easy to overpower but those big fish you have to be more careful especially with big sharks frequently they'll exhaust themselves to death so if you know that you're fighting a, a hammerhead or other protected species definitely recommend cutting the hook whereas if you're just fishing a little lake and you're catching bass and releasing them like what what's the harm really i mean people can say fishing is unethical but as long as you're not leaving trash you're using circle hooks you're minimizing the fish's suffering and you're still having fun and being aligned with nature you know what what's really the issue and i think there's also this notion of okay if animals are so smart why does it always seem like they're just mindless they're just on autopilot all the time and to that i say look at the human the typical human are they not on autopilot the vast majority of the time? It really is a way that because we're guided so much by the subconscious and the subconscious wants to be us to be on autopilot and to be lazy when we can be lazy, that's a big way of saving energy. Because think about it, if you had to consciously think about every single movement instead of it coming automatically, like you'd waste so much energy and muscle memory is definitely a thing if you've ever I mean you don't even have to play sports like just look at you know how you move your your limbs or, or anything it just comes automatically you barely even think about it just look at walking when you first learned how to walk yeah it was pretty tough now you just you can talk while you're walking like think about how complex that is and you take it for granted until the first time you get drunk and then they're like, oh, maybe this is harder than I, I imagined. Yeah, so many things, so many complex things are guided by the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, because it works. Like, look at the game theory of the prisoner's dilemma. The solution for that was uh, tick for tack, or tit for tat, which was one of the most simple algorithms that was developed. So it really pays off to be simple sometimes. So yeah, you can look at your typical animal like an elephant. Okay, it was born, it was taken care of, it eats, it mates, it defecates, it dies. Like, that's it. But then look at your life. How is it much different? Playing video games, reading, just a few more higher magnitude stuff, like watching Netflix the majority of the time, or just listening to stuff, browsing YouTube stuff.
other animals would definitely do that too if they had the capabilities for sure. Like, And I just don't get why we're the moral animal because we have the capability of doing good stuff and other animals aren't. But that's a whole nother philosophical debate, I guess. We have capability of doing super evil stuff and good stuff. You know, I'm not even sure if other animals would care about saving the world. They care about their own species. Let me take that back. They care about some other species to some degree. Especially if they are lonely and they can develop bonds with other animals. But as a whole, I don't I don't know if anybody knows if other animals you know, there's keystone species, there's engineering species that are vital for the ecosystems. But do they purposely do that? I kind of doubt it. Not to say what they're doing is not intelligent. It definitely is. Like a beaver makes pond-like environments. That supports a whole cast of other organisms. So it's definitely intelligent whether they realize it or not. But before I really start diving into animal intelligence and how to measure it, you know, there's a big fallacy in measuring an animal's intelligence or any organism based on ourselves because we're just one type of intelligence. Maybe there's other types that are completely different. It's like judging a fish's ability to climb a tree. If you only did that, then yeah, it's not very good at surviving at all. But there might be types of intelligence that are beyond our scope presently. Or, you know, we just generally misunderstand and think that it's something else, but maybe it is more intelligent than we think. We just never know until we have a clean slate, a clean mind, and go from the bottom up versus trying to just compare it based on what we're doing. Whatever we do is just one strategy. Maybe there's completely different strategies, you know? Which is why I love when people try to say, oh, Dolphins are just pretending to be stupid. They're going to take over the world one day, right? I think it was Guardians... What what was it called? The 42 is the meaning of life. It says that dolphins will be the overrulers or something. I don't know. But they're definitely very, very smart. Of course, you didn't come to that conclusion by assuming they're smart or not smart. Actually, one more thing. So, morality too is another thing. Like, how do you exactly define it besides hurting people? Of course, that's not moral. There's so many things that are up for debate that people, when it doesn't align with their inner feelings, they feel it's immoral, but really, is it? Is it really? You know, preferences, disgust, definitely have a big factor in that. And some animals seem to have that, but I'll get into that later. Perhaps, maybe another part, maybe never. But, you know, I'm I'm making these mainly for fun, not to cover controversial, just stressful stuff. I'm making this for fun, fulfillment, if anybody else wants to listen. And, uh, yeah, we'll dive right into it. All right, as much as I want to start talking about cats and why they're better than dogs, (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, It's up to preferences. They're different. But first, why did animals or life in general evolve intelligence? Well, first you have to ask how. Are there any animals without brains? Are there any animals without a nervous system? Of course, bacteria, the simplest form of life, doesn't have a nervous system. Yet they still respond and adapt to their environment. Or at least respond to stimuluses. As with other single-celled organisms, uh, paramecium's, amoebas. They're, they can be predatory amoebas. Um... They respond to stimuluses, but in general, you know, they're not very complex at all, yet they respond to the environment and they know how to replicate. So in a way, first let's define intelligence. All right, this is from Google, just searching define intelligence as definitely more broad than I expected. Intelligence being the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. So you think, okay, man is the only intelligent animal. 
or so they say. So if we saw the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills in other animals, they must be intelligent. So obviously that that's happened, happens a lot. You know, there's some very intelligent birds and mammals. You know, of course, people will say, oh, how can birds be smart? They have super small brains. Well, their brains are more complex. They still have a bunch of neurons. So they compensate by for small brains by having more complex structures and or more neurons packed in. Definitely crows are one of corvids in general, crows and ravens. Super complex, but we'll get to that, or maybe. So of course, animals evolve brains in general to better sense their environment, better learn, better adapt, better just have better habits in general go toward what's favorable I mean natural selection will will pick what's more favorable and optimal anyways but in general you see that bigger brain size isn't always favorable so that's not a deciding factor there's so many other weapons that can evolve you know claws speed but you can become as fast as you want but if you're not coordinated enough you know look at birds they can really dive and go really fast but that means that they need bigger brains to better judge depth or more sophisticated brains for judging that depth speed and all that so that probably has a part to do with their intelligence and clearly not all decision making is fully conscious that's largely because of survival because you need to make a decision before even thinking about it the nervous system picks over does that for you right you know you think why did I do something why did I flinch like it's just automatic when somebody is threatening you because that's what will protect you it's not so somebody can make fun of you like why are you flinching I wasn't going to hurt you well I didn't know that you know and I know there's all kinds of quirks and automatic processes with the nervous system way too much that I probably there's a lot I don't know about and I can't cover in the course of even an hour let alone you know 30 minutes or however long this is going to be but just keep in mind that the nervous system controls the organism and is the central that's why they call it central nervous system it controls all the functions whether it's conscious or unconscious so you really study an animal you know, you can study one part, you can study aspects, but the real glue to it is the nervous system. Without the nervous system, the animal will just, things can't connect. They're not going to learn, you know, that's, that's the command center. So, there's one type of animal that lacks neurons, at least in the adult stage, and that's sponges. And if God, you know, that was definitely a big joke or he was drunk or something when those were made because they're animals. They have free moving larvae, which definitely means they evolved from something that was free moving. But for whatever reason, when they become adults, they filter feed. I think corals, they in part get energy from photosynthesis through other organisms, through a uh, mutualism or commensalism so there are animals that lack complex nervous systems or any nervous system and the exact processes of how they function without a nervous system I don't know but whatever works definitely for more complex organisms you need a brain of some sort you need some sort of response to the environment you know and I was just looking I found this interesting video titled the evolution of intelligence because obviously i don't have all the answers so i was just looking up what i could find and it was definitely interesting it was saying how one individual fish is not very smart not very adaptable but in a school of fish it's very very complex and very adaptable and it's the same in our brains or any brain one little neuron is nothing but in a network of neurons it's a functional unit it's very intelligent and different parts have different functions it went on to say it was also interesting it compared bees in a beehive to our brain 
where if they're wagging about, you know, communicating with the group, hey, we should do this. If it's given more attention to it, it's wagging more, you know, using resources to try to do something, then more attention will be paid to it. And the same thing happens in our brain of sorts. There's neural networks. When there's two competing ideas for decision making, if one seems, okay, we should do that, then your consciousness will recognize that more, right? Because it's always looking for patterns and shortcuts, whether we want to or not. The subconscious, you know, if it says, okay, this this video is, I'm not learning anything, you know, I'm better off watching TV, looking at this other YouTube video, it's going to do that. You're barely even going to think about it. There is, it's very multi-layered and there's so many things we don't understand about our own brain, let alone other animals' brains. Or people like to say that our brains are the most complex, but how do how do we know? We don't know everything about animal intelligence. Might be something way more complex than we are. And I know what you're probably thinking. We definitely, as a species, have the most neurons in our brains because we're the most intelligent. Well, I have news for you. We don't have the most neurons out of any animal brain. There's actually two, at least two or three that have more neurons in their brain than we do. Of course, we have the frontal cortex. Maybe that's why it seems like we're more intelligent. We have more sections or a better developed consciousness section, which is the frontal cortex, if I recall correctly. Uh, I'm trying to find the list. All right, so the human brain, this seems like an average range from 16.34 billion neurons to 21 billion neurons, which is above the blue whale, which is 15 billion neurons. There's, well, within our range, the Rhesus dolphin, 18.75 billion, but well beyond us are the short-finned pilot whale and the long-finned pilot whale. 35 billion to 37.2 billion and at the very top you want to guess what it is is it a the dolphin b the tiger c killer whale or d the chimpanzee turns out it's the killer whale orca 43 point oh i forgot the drum roll oh oh well <laughs> it's always next time no drum roll um this is not your typical podcast. <laughs> I do it like I want it. All right. But 43.1 billion. Does that mean they're the smartest? Well, I saw them at SeaWorld like a year or two ago. They're definitely very, very smart, trainable. I'm not saying I agree with SeaWorld, but it's definitely terrifying to see how well they can be trained. And they're definitely apex predators of the ocean. If they lived on land, they would probably dominate over us, probably, maybe. Um that's terrifying so I would definitely not want to evolve to go back into the sea uh, they did for some reason well they they evolved from dolphins yeah fairly recently in geological time but I'm sure there has to be a range for species because think about the dumbest human you'd ever I mean there's all kinds of safeguards nowadays there's probably a lot more stupidity now that versus hundreds of years ago but in general, there's a huge range among humans, so there has to be a range among other animals, other species. Although, there are averages, you know. Of course, I'm going to bet on the average human being way more smart on average than the average, I don't know, cockroach or whatever you want. Well, obviously, our brains are much more complex. Not to say that's the only measure of what's the best animal or you can't even measure that it's based on the criteria actually uh elephants have more neurons in their brain than us although their brain is much larger they had a lot more neurons in the cerebellum which controls fine movement equilibrium posture and motor learning so probably makes sense being such a large mammal on land you need more uh balance and motor skills probably moving around but for sure they're definitely very intelligent and there's been a lot said for them 
they probably deserve to be romanticized and have all kinds of tributes. They're way more smarter than even I can comprehend. I probably wouldn't believe it for sure until I actually saw it. Well, there's all kinds of evidence out there. Here's one quick article. It lists how elephants are so smart. Maybe some of these are impressive. Maybe or at least some of these are not so much, but we like to think that's super intelligent. They have extraordinary memories. They can recognize members after a long separation. Whoa, even after 20 years apart. Yeah, that's pretty intense. They mimic human voices. Okay, it, I mean, parrots can do that. They're, they're pretty intelligent too, but they mourn their dead. That's definitely something I've heard. You know, they definitely do that. Pay respect. They, they visit their graves too, you know, pay tribute. Um... They show empathy toward distress. You know, we probably have bias toward that, but, you know, they're social animals. They, if there is more howdy in animals, they definitely have it. They understand human body language. Well, I'll, I'll get into that, but cats definitely do too, to some degree. And dogs and a lot of animals, I bet. Which is actually more sophisticated than verbal language. And I'll, I'll definitely get into that. They can use tools. That's definitely a big plus. Chimpanzees can too. I can't remember if Bonobos, the other one that is closely related to us, they might be able to, but definitely it's impressive that an herbivore, you know, any herbivore can use tools. So, yeah. They can fashion fly swatters out of branches or grass. They can dig holes to reach drinking water. Yeah, that's, that's pretty innovative. And then plugging the hole with a ball formed from chewed bark to prevent the water from evaporating, thus saving it for later use. I mean, you think about it, like, animals evolve intelligence to survive better, right? Because intelligence that's passed down, that helps with survival, that's natural selection. You know, not everything that evolves is direct, you know, directly related to survival. Look at sexual selection, you know deer having super big antlers and fighting off males that what what does that have to do with survival what well, helps with mate selection and mate selection is definitely that's a whole nother topic but it affects gene flow for sure and apparently elephants can identify languages that's pretty crazy i think it was on elephants that they played a call from a dead member this is kind of dark but it shows how intelligent they are they got super excited it's like somebody played a recording of a dead elephant they got super excited like where is he like what and then turns out when they figured out he's not coming they got super depressed and yeah but you know i don't mean to laugh but shows how intelligent they are they they have expectations they can make those connections they definitely have long-term memory they can recognized members from 20 years ago even though they they live long lives but you definitely have to have a complex brain complex memories to remember something from 20 years ago i mean even 10 years ago feels like forever ago uh, at least for me being 28 but well uh 10 years ago wasn't that far but, but 15 years like yeah that was but i can still remember you know it depends on the topic how much emotional significance there was oh yeah so the question arises is the smart are the smartest animals the most moral animals well depends on what you define as morality because it changes all the time over the course of cultures and time Look at Western culture. It used to be super immoral to, to even see the same couple sleeping in the same bed. Right? There used to be sitcoms or TV shows where, <laughs> you know, married couples would sleep in separate beds, if not separate bedrooms, too. You know, of course, that changed over time. Premarital sex views about that completely changed. Even premar premarital pregnancies seem to be becoming okay. You know, and who's to say, you know, it's a natural thing. Um, you know, we have our own opinions and we think we know what's best and what's most moral. But 
really who's to say at the end of the day and I know ultimately nature and natural systems are all about sustainability and social animals are about cooperation right because you think that the most selfish self-serving organisms would be the strongest but that's clearly not the case with social animals they develop types of intelligence and cohesion based to become a soup a solitary social unit so it may seem like they're soup being super cooperated and selfless but actually they're being self-serving with kin selection by having altruism and sacrificing resources for the good of the group so then being in a group has an advantage over being an individual unit so in a way it is selfish but in a way it's not because you're thinking about the good of the group but you're better off in the group so it's a double-edged sword in a way whether it's good or bad you know who knows but ultimately that's what nature selected for in a lot of cases for those social units so by what we define as morality that is you know cooperation sacrificing the good of yourself for the good of the group is mostly in social animals that have you have that complex dynamic so it really seems like if you want to look at a moral animal look at other social animals also one not just ourselves but another very very smart animal is also incredibly violent uh, chimpanzees they'll wage wars against one another and they're like the opposite of bonobos that they're very cooperative open you know to other members that are not a part of the group as I've heard chimps are more like wolves but bonobos are more like dogs that's not to say that bonobos are smarter and that they're more compassionate you know we have to check our cognitive biases just because something appears to be acting more morally doesn't necessarily mean that they have higher intelligence you know and you can't look at somebody immoral doing something that's morally rehensible and say you're super not intelligent when their intelligence and morality are mutually exclusive just as emotions and intelligence are mutually exclusive and a lot of times being overly emotional gets in the way of intelligence because it floods the brain and your amygdala goes crazy and your it shuts off your frontal cortex so you hear all the time don't go to bed angry with a spouse but I think that's a really terrible idea because you'll just get more and more heated and probably lead to do something you'll probably regret versus sleeping on it and then making a compromise hopefully you know I'm no relationship ex expert but I've definitely had a wide range of emotions and sometimes you just have to bookmark it and come back to it later when you can't come to a logical conclusion when you're being super emotional <laughs> you know anything even with the smartest cat I've ever known Leo the orange one uh, that was in the munchie video um he's incredibly smart for a cat he really appreciates sinks which i i think that's really a big sign of intelligence he realizes whoa this thing just spits out water if, as long as i want it to and not only that he's figured out ways to sneak into cabinets well not the newer ones because but the old wooden ones he'd be able to slip into and you know kind of peek around and he's tried with the newer ones that have handles but and then it surprises me it's been like years it'll be years and years since he's last been in a cabinet I'll hold one open and he'll be like oh I can check it out but probably the smartest thing he's figured out um, when begging for food you know he'll sit on the bench next to me when I still live at home my original home uh, and instead of you know meowing which he doesn't really like doing in general I guess because it wastes energy or I don't know um, instead of jumping on the table because that just leads to trouble he'll reach a paw and touch your arm and he's figured out that's more likely than anything else to do he'd do to 
get get you to feed him, you know. And uh, and any time you're in the kitchen, he'll jump up, whether he's sleeping or whatever, jump into the kitchen, whether he's even if he's hungry or not. You know, he'll figure out a way for to get you to feed him. And Munchie was similar. Uh, you know, she would meow all the time, and uh, even just being on the computer, uh, she was bored, wanted uh, you to her to play with you. You know, oh, and I miss her. Or she wanted you to play with her. I meant to say, uh, yeah. But you know, all cats have incredible memory and personality types for sure which i mean all all kinds of animals have different personalities i've even heard sharks have personalities i think even bony fish probably have personality differences or genetic differences that cause them to behave slightly differently because i'll be catching fish and be like oh this catfish fought a lot more or this pinfish fought a lot more even though there's there's trends not to say they have like distinct like human like personalities but there's definitely variances at least uh who's to say you know what you know definitely you see that with dogs upbringing has a lot to do with that as with cats i've even this is crazy even i've heard if you this is kind of a dark study but if you covered uh cat vision as they're developing if you cover an eye or both eyes they won't develop fully develop vision if you cover their eyes which is crazy um you think that's just an innate thing and they'll just evolve it but a lot of things you think are genetic but are actually developmental over the course of their life of course in humans you have to learn language by a certain age or else you probably won't social skills uh all kinds of things that are more developmental than innate you definitely can't forget dogs they're definitely smarter than cats not to say that they're better that's just one measure <laughs> you know I'm, I'm still biased more for cats they're less smelly they don't poop everywhere uh, uh, of course dogs can do tricks I could say how many more neurons dogs have than cats but really who cares <laughs> no um, I'll, I'll post the link in the description you on youtube i'll probably also post this on podbean but uh of the it's it's not that huge of a difference but you can look for yourself and look at the other animals and, and compare even though you know it's just one measure it doesn't necessarily mean like say african elephant has more or no i was surprised some of the herbivores actually have more neurons than you'd think like cat the cat is actually pretty mid-range um oh pigs have more uh, neurons than cats I, I thought that was surprising of course lions do you know even some birds have way more neurons in their brain than cats which is surprising you you know you think you know cats are they're so adaptable and i bet they probably could learn tricks i don't think i think they just don't want to <laughs> you know they just go their own way some people even say they're not fully domesticated which i might agree with they're pretty wild um you have to go by their rules more than you know vice versa yeah people who say cats are one-dimensional are really missing out in life in general uh cats are great the the greatest ones especially not just for playing but for interacting with for giving attention mutual connection you know and just because you know wild animals will be wild and not get along with humans as much doesn't mean that they're smarter or less moral it's just they're just made differently you know um whoa walruses have a lot of neurons holy crap three billion three point nine billion that's pretty surprising right above mandrill baboons huh but large mammals in general i wouldn't say all of them but probably most of them have pretty sizable brains uh let's see if manatees are on here i wonder i mean they're herbivores but and, uh, 
Oh, they're not on here. I don't know. But I mean, they care for their young. I, I imagine it's probably pretty sizable. But yeah, before I forget, or before I run out of time here, um, you know, people I've read in these philosophy of animal versus human morality saying that animals can't have morality because they don't have a language they can't decipher things which is faulty because it's assuming that because they don't have language they're stupid so that's a cognitive bias for sure but also think about it how long has spoken language been around you know a few thousand years at most body language in animals has been around for millions upon millions of years it's developed I mean, just even look at the research. When you're in a conversation, body language and tone has to do with conveying a message way more, way, way more than what you actually say, which at first I was like, what? No, it. what you say is most important. Actually, it's how you say it and your body language is actually what conveys it. Because think about it, if you say something even simple like, what would you say oh you probably have the job like imagine somebody being super you know they have their arms and legs crossed looking in another direction and say oh i guess you have the job versus somebody who has is spread open they're smiling like oh i guess you got the job you know it, it's completely different you know that's more emotionally charged than most things you'd say or want to listen to but it goes to show you know there's so much more than just words. Otherwise, texting would be a perfect way to convey something. And as research continues to show, texting leads to so many misinterpreted messages and so much heartbreak. It's absolutely not just because of emoticons, which what nobody really knows what emoticons do unless it's universally agreed upon. And even then, like, what is a smiley face versus an LOL? Like, what, what has more significance? There's no universal agreements. Whereas with body language, that's pretty universal and built into our subconscious and innate, I would say, our genes. But so much of our upbringing is it's hard to pinpoint with genes, you know, nature versus nurture. We might think something is genetic, but it's actually more cultural, but that's a whole other debate. So, one of my main tasks in making this video and doing research and really making connections was trying to pinpoint our cat's moral animals. You know, it depends on your definitions. Well, first, can they process emotions? Do they even have emotions? Which I have a pretty general web page here. Do cats have emotions? It's not clear whether they have self-awareness of emotions, but they do read body language for sure. Which, you know, even looking at a cat, if you look at them all wide-eyed and be standing up and stuff, especially if you don't know the cats, they'll be threatened. So they definitely respond to body language. They're social animals. If you close your eyes and kind of give them a tired-eyed look, that's actually pretty a trusting look. I don't know if it has to do with, oh, I don't have to watch you. I'm not, you know, they, they just like to do that. It releases oxytocin and endorphins. For some reason, they like to do that. So, and they like to rub up against you. And well, first, when you're meeting a cat, you have to crouch down and reach out, you know, show you're submissive. You're, you know, you're not bigger than them. You're giving away power by extending your limbs, whether they realize it or not. They respond to that body language and over time but especially if from a young age they're integrated with people they get along with people much easier which as my parents adopted two grown feral cats for some reason you know one of them i think has stockholm syndrome um and really likes my dad for some reason but like will get along with other people but not quite fully trust other people not very easy at all and the other one is just kind of like, oh, whatever. I'll just live on my own. And if I get some attention, fine. If not, I'm fine with that too. Feral cats just don't, in general, don't get along with other people very well. Well, I think past a certain age. 
because Munchie was feral, but I think she was still fairly young when we adopted her. And she still loved to play. Well, that was really in her personality. She loved to hunt. Uh, got along with people really well. Loved to eat. And, uh, yeah. If we define morality as extending their self-interest beyond themselves, then yes, cats are moral. They care about non... Well, they might see humans as big cats. Well, caregivers. Uh, they definitely care about themselves, but... I, Actually, I know they care about welfare of others too. Even though they are cold-blooded killers in a way because they kill small animals. It's it's just built into them. Because when they're on farms and they you know, were raised in Africa, they helped defend against pests. And those kind of cats were given more attention than the ones that didn't kill the pests as readily. So it makes sense that now they're just all killers and some people hate them and think they're just cold blooded killers, but no, they're they're not all. They're pretty compassionate toward larger their caregivers. But definitely small game. They they don't hate them. You know, they won't actively like constantly all day hunt after, you know, small animals because they love to sleep, love to save energy. That just seems to be a universal in cats in general. Maybe not all species of cats, but most cats I think. Um, you know, but also dogs, you know, who's to say they're more moral just because we bred them to be super friendly and I don't have anything against them, but they're definitely the most, uh, their genes are really malleable and we really bred them even more exclusively than cats because cats kind of domesticated themselves. Um, they chose to be domesticated, maybe dogs did too in a way, maybe. I don't, I'm not too keen on that. You know, not just because cats will care, will give you affection and all that just to be fed, which they definitely will. They'll take advantage of you to play and be fed and stuff. But sometimes just laying in bed, you know, and I just sleep late. And sometimes my uh, gray kitty, uh, Sadie, who I've known since I was in high school, uh, she would visit me, you know, when I was sleeping kind of being like hey wake up like are you all right and you know I, i'm sure plenty of cat owners will attest to that kind of behavior of checking up on their owners and really showing compassion and, and uh, concern but uh dogs will definitely do that um not say this is a competition or anything they're just different yeah um so are cats dogs any animals moral Again, it depends on your definition. They definitely have, depending on what species you are, capabilities of good, capabilities to be less good, and go into the gray territory, darker territories, depending on how big you are. Uh, if you're a prey species, yeah, you're going to hate, even though it's good for natural balance. You know, some people might see tigers as evil, but it's just in their their habits to hunt large mammals like us. Yeah, actually, you know the way to defend against tigers eating you. It seems very, like it wouldn't work, and it's very counterintuitive, but actually works. If you wear a mask on the back of your head that has eyes, or pseudo eyes that looks like it's watching, tigers won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, which, I, I wish there was something like that for snakes. Um, prevent snakes from attack. Well, you can wear snake boots. That definitely helps. Uh, because... You think about it, tigers want to ambush and have an easy kill. If they're looking at something that's looking back at them, they know it'll probably escape, so it'd just be wasting energy taking out the human. So at first it seems like tigers are stupid. They they must know that it's fake, but actually they're smarter than that. They they know that they'd be most likely wasting energy by going after the person that has eyes all over them. I think that's also why butterflies also have fake eyes because they know or they they don't know but they evolved the ones that evolved stuff to have eyes on them survive better than the ones that don't have fake eyes so the question arises do dogs recognize themselves in the mirror turns out they don't they can't recognize their selves in the mirror but then again they're not highly sight oriented 
compared to their smell which there's evidence apparently that they can recognize their own smell so they have some self-awareness in that that way uh cats probably can't but then again like there's so much besides just self-awareness looking at themselves in the mirror that you can prove intelligence you know if you have these rigorous tests of you know complex mental problem solving you know they may or may not solve it but that doesn't fully show their capabilities based on one little rigorous test you know there's there's so many ways actually if you look up the definition of sentience which probably made it seem like we have this so we have consciousness but other animals don't sentience means to feel perceive or experience subjectively and i think as people start realizing that other animals have sentience they can feel perceive learn uh, feel pain have memories emotional bonds and all that i think that's why they came up with the term sapience which seems synonymous with wisdom is the ability to think and act using knowledge experience understanding common sense and insight uh, but even then like i i can imagine a lot of higher order higher intelligence uh mammals and birds have sapience because even i've heard like prairie dogs you wouldn't think are very smart they they have a language system that's pretty descriptive and so and so many of these links i've heard that pretty much we're not the only ones with language even dolphins have you know even though they speak in clicks and all that they name their individuals and they can speak to each other and communicate so you'd think there's just more and more research we're not the only animals that have sophisticated languages and it's hard to believe but even though body language still has a bigger role perhaps but it's not the only way we can communicate even though it's the most primitive it's definitely the most established so even though people say that we can perfectly communicate in words there's so much more to communication than just what you say if you look at the research I'm telling you like I still think just because it's the latest and quote unquote greatest way to communicate I don't think well obviously yeah the problem with there's different languages one word can mean so many different things saying a word in the right context there's so many loophole well not loopholes but uh pitfalls of organized language that was just developed hundreds of years ago versus something that's literally we don't even have to think about and we know what it means when someone smiles at us and has open body language, we don't even think about it. We know what they're up to, generally speaking. You know, they might be deceptive, but that's a whole other topic. But if they're being completely honest, we can read body language and we know what they mean, what they're generally up to. Versus language, there's so many filters, you have to decipher what it actually means. And before I conclude one more thing we have to be conscious of our cognitive biases when we view something as intelligent even among people if it's I'm sure research has shown that when people have similar opinions and values as us we see them as more intelligent but we have to look past that and that's just a cognitive bias of we align with other people who share our values because we we prefer it there's a positive feedback loop yes yes this is a quality person therefore they're smart they're like us everything's going good but it might not mean that they're smarter than somebody who we find morally reprehensible you know not always but i'm just saying in general that people are very biased and they let their emotions get the best of them i'm just saying this in general not i don't have any ulterior agenda or whatever you want to call it but uh yeah pretty sure sh- i know this this podcast went pretty good pretty good overview uh of course you can't cover all the examples i barely got into birds but uh and there 
I'm telling you, crows, ravens, magpies, they, I have to admit, like, I saw this reading the the book Inside Animal Hearts and Minds, really good general intelligence book about examples of, even though it's pretty biased and what we find super, super intelligent, but uh, I was impressed, like, both chimps and I think it was crows, some kind of corvid, when playing cooperation games, uh, when they would get paid, you know, in like fruit or something for doing something, for doing a task, they would cooperate. And if they saw another individual also doing the same thing, but getting paid less, getting less food or less quality food, they would stop cooperating because they, they saw the game as unfair. So they cared about the welfare of their other animal, which does that mean they have morality or does that mean they're trying to it might be selfish for uh, developing a social bond with their fellow member of the species more than them being moral you know you, we have such biases we want to think that animals are super moral but how yeah it's just good in general not to generalize about a certain species there can be huge variations there can be cooperating Especially if they're a social animal, yeah, they're going to cooperate. They're going to act for the good of the group, for survival and for thriving. You might think of that as super moral, but then again, we're biased because we're social animals. We like that. We think, yes, that's the right thing to do. So in the grand scheme of things, maybe it is better than being self-serving. But then again, we're not solitary animals, so who knows in the grand scheme of things. But we like what we like, and that makes the world go round and yeah we like social animals that are cute cuddly cooperate and less so for the self-serving scaly toothy stuff even though i've heard with sharks you know you unhook a shark you'd think it would just be thrashing about and biting even though you removed its hook even though they're more primitive than you know, the bigger, more denser, more neuroned animals, they still form bonds with people. They can. If you help them out, you pet them, unhook them, or if they've had a hook stuck in them, they'll actually come back and visit you, and they recognize somehow. Yeah, so they're definitely more intelligent than we give them credit for. They're not just mindless, brainless, no-memory killers, you know. They're definitely predators. We're predators. We have a lot of potential for good and evil, like uh, any other big-brained with lots of weapons animals. But like I said, you have to look at the characteristics, look at the criteria, and the big picture. And that's all I can say. So yeah, thanks for listening. Well, I would say this is my longest podcast, but I'm pretty sure I've made hour-long ones before. If I really super edit it, I'm sure I can make it 40 minutes, but most of the time it's just too much work for what it's worth. This was definitely a good, definitely free talk, but also doing some research. I'll definitely make sure to save the links of uh, videos and web pages I mentioned, or just interesting ones in general. There's definitely much more research and definitely you have doubts let me know do your own research ask me questions um open to all that content suggestions you know for the most part I just do whatever i want feel like what i think is most fulfilling and aligns with my specialties of sorts you know again i'm not a biologist or official scientist even though i have a environmental science degree so i'm kind of smart but not too too smart but then again like just had to look at the research and make connections speculations and there's definitely a lot more to learn from animals it's a shame that so many of them are dying out before we can really get a chance to really know them and know their habits in their natural environment but for sure a lot of stuff is just built for survival and damn I 
definitely I'm starting to regret eating all those chocolate espresso beans. I feel like I could go on and go on and keep going, but I need sleep, man. I, I got to do more, uh, kill some mosquitoes tomorrow. Mosquito larvae. I thought I was going to talk about that more, about killing plants and mosquitoes and the morality of that, but it's, it's kind of funny in a way, uh, people, you know, we're way more related to mosquitoes because they're animals. We share a common ancestor. Well, all life does, but definitely share a closer common ancestor with any insect, way more than any plant. And again, it, it comes down to spiritual connection because we have a better spiritual connection with dogs than chimps. But so we feel a lot more connected with dogs than chimps. You know, genetically, we're more, we should feel more kinship with the primates because we are primates. So people might want not want to admit it, but we are. When you want to look at human psychology, you have to look at primate psychology, whether you want to or not. As Franz DeWall and all the re other researchers will tell you, I'm telling you, don't take my word for it. Take the word of the real experts and not just your gut. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, we, we hate mosquitoes, man, because they just want to suck our blood just to annoy us. But, no, they're they're doing it not to eat but to reproduce. They need that protein. Hell, you want to know a super innocent animal, animal that I can ruin for you? Cows eat animals. Yeah, I didn't know that until just stumbling upon that in a podcast but they eat snakes you know I don't remember all the animals they might eat but for protein every once in a while so then again like nature has no agenda besides survival and cooperating had its advantages so that was built in to animals over time social animals so you have weapons, you have cooperating. There's so many tools in the nature toolbox and they just build over time. And the bad stuff, the not bad morally, but the ineffective stuff dies out. That's just natural selection. And though we don't really realize it because we allow everything to survive, but that's a whole nother topic I don't want to cover. I think I still think it's funny that I don't feel remorse for taking out mosquitoes for their larvae, even though I remember working for the job taking out aquatic plants, we'd also take out uh, midge flies, which they are real nuisance when, especially in big lakes, they'll really become dense and it becomes a health issue, even though the county I work for doesn't recognize that because they don't transmit diseases. <laughs> Or viruses they don't mosquitoes don't spread corona thankfully don't want to work super overtime <laughs> no i don't want to work any overtime except the fish events but but those are pretty easy just in the summertime giving out mosquito fish and the mosquito fish will eat mosquito larvae even though mosquitoes breed less so in lakes and more in flood water because they they're super super adaptable and will find any significant source of flood water even in tires or tarps if you like you know I don't do domestics too much but um, when people were saying oh all the mosquitoes are coming from the air conditioner I look in there there's some float there's some standing water in there like where do you think it's coming from you know and then again like everybody thinks they have a problem and once they solve that problem, their life will be super happy if they buy a product. They've been, you know, but you have to look at the big picture. I'm babbling. I am so regretting eating all those chocolate espresso beans, even though I'm glad I did that podcast, you know, this podcast, that, this, that. Uh, what else? Yeah, I'd feel bad if mosquitoes weren't sustainable. Um, but they're pests they will always be around as long as they have habitat which is standing water that will always be a constant and 
you know, you can argue about the spirituality of being in the business of extermination, but it's not that intelligent. It's mosquitoes, they're pretty simple. Even if they're less simple, they're invertebrates. They're pests. Yeah, I'm not going to speak further on the ethics of that. It's Most people agree with it. Not to say what people agree with is always the right thing or the most normal, agreeable thing. But and I just saw in one of the blog posts I had about cat intelligence, it says that cats have longer lasting long-term memory than dogs. <laughs> I don't know if it's completely true, but I'm sure both are up there. But I'm definitely taking that because I'm biased more toward cats. So I'm taking that as a that W over dogs <laughs> taking that to the bank um but yeah just so i don't regret not saying more about corvids show how smart they are here's from the corviday wikipedia page general description proving that they are super smart you know of course look at the research don't just take my word for it but i'm just i'm telling you i've heard it time and time again they've tested and tested it okay so to quote when compared to dogs and cats in, ex in an experiment testing the ability to seek out food according to three-dimensional cues, corvids outperformed the mammals. A meta-analysis testing how often birds invented new ways to acquire food in the wild found corvids to be the most innovative birds. A 2004 review suggests that their cognitive abilities are on par with that of the great apes. Despite structural differences, the brains of corvids and great apes both evolved the ability to make geometrical measurements. So definitely convergent evolution to, you know, who's to say what's more intelligent? They evolved to reach a similar goal. But, yeah, I mean, you can measure different measures, but who's to say what's more intelligent? Probably more intelligent in different ways. Corvid ingenuity is represented through their feeding skills, memorization abilities, use of tools, and group behavior. I mean, just look at crazy bird people. <laughs> like, you know, I've even heard if you feed crows, you know, they'll they'll develop a bond with you and just bring you random objects as a gift, which is pretty crazy to think about. It. You just feed a wild animal; it starts giving you random stuff. <laughs> That's pretty ingenious. Living in large social groups has long been connected with high cognitive ability. To live in a large group, a member must be able to recognize individuals and track the social position and foraging of other members over time. Yeah, they have to distinguish so much information about other individuals. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much straightforward. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty good overview about animal intelligence you know there's a lot of things i've skipped over or missed more than likely they can feel pain they have emotions there's still much more similarities with us and other all vertebrates than differences as much as people want to say no humans are completely different we have souls we have this we have that like okay maybe it's more superficial than we think like just because we have culture we're quote unquote sophisticated i mean we came out of nature we share so many other mental pathways and physiological needs socio dynamic needs that other animals have they want to belong they want to be a part of a social group with a common goal they want to mate they want to have a good life you know as good as it can be you know we all think again that we all are flawed and we just need that one thing we need but in a way animals are more wise i feel like because they know they need overall balance in their life not just what do i need currently in the present you know they look at the big picture and we're connected with nature and one and one with it we're a part of nature. We're not separated from nature. You know, it's so easy to think. We are because we live in cities. We live in house, artificial. Like, no, what our food comes from energy from the sun, not from the grocery store. It, yeah, you get it from the grocery store, but the energy comes from 
nature in the external environment all right so thanks for listening uh that's it for now and try to get this out as soon as possible because i'm pretty proud of it lots of insights and uh yeah typical like if you want comment if you want subscribe if you want and see you guys next time all right